Thank you so much, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, everyone in the room, everyone watching on the live stream now and later. My name's Ruri. My pronouns are he and they. I manage uh, NSUN's Community Constellations project. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first part of um, the first panel of NSUN's AGM. We're going to be talking about resourcing user led groups and how, and how to do that. We and the wider world has to move beyond the idea of people with experience of mental ill health as passive beneficiaries. Um, we'll have a discussion with our panelists and then we'll open things up for questions at the end. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat all the way through, or at the end, you can indicate that you'd like to speak by raising your hand on Zoom. So through NSUN's Community Constellations Project and our side-by-side -side grant funding program, through my own experiences of grassroots mental health spaces, I've seen how crucial it is that mental health work be properly resourced. And when we think about resources, we're thinking about money, but we're also thinking about time, space, knowledge, skills. Often user-led grassroots groups have an abundance of some of those resources. So we know a lot about our communities and what they need, for instance, but lack others like funding or time. So I'm really excited to hear from our panelists who have experience of navigating those challenges and have ideas for how to kind of change and challenge the system so that grassroots user-led mental health work can thrive. I'm gonna introduce all three of them in one go and then I'll hand over to each of them individually to kind of give a bit more depth on them and their work and to talk about how they resource their work as well. So we have Axe. Axe is a student, educator, and cultural producer. They're a co-creator of Misery, which is a creative mental health community and sober party for queer, trans, intersex, Black, Indigenous people, and people of colour. In their current day job, they're the Relationships Manager for Diversity in London at Arts Council England. We have Emma. Emma Ormorod is the co-founder, artistic director, and CEO of Underground Lights a theatre company based in Coventry led by and for people with experience of mental health issues and or homelessness. Emma has worked as a researcher for NSUN and more recently as an NSUN associate. She's also supported the delivery of NSUN's COVID-19 grant fund in 2020 and the side-by-side -side fund earlier this year. And we have Leah Chikamba. Leah founded her organisation Angels of Hope for Women in 2014 to support women from Black, Asian and other minoritised and racialised backgrounds. They received one of Ensign's side-by-side -side grants earlier this year. In her day job, she manages children's centres in Manchester. So I'll hand over to our panellists to give a bit more background on themselves and talk about how they resource their grassroots user-led work. Ax, um, you have to go first. Yeah. Hi all, I'm Ax. Um, so I'm one of the co-producers, co-creators of Misery. Uh, how do I keep this quick? I could talk for ages. We do everything. And I guess this is kind of um, one of the things of being a user-led group or you're not a service or a product that's out there. You're sort of creating space to survive. So you're kind of doing everything and figuring out what we do has been part of the journey. Before the pandemic, we would throw sober raves. Um, we recognized that for queer people, the only space to really gather was nightclubs. Um, which is surrounded by alcohol, drugs, sex, which can be great and empowering, no judgment, but also is the only option available. Um, and wanting to be able to embody and learn the lessons from these powerful community spaces, how can we do that and really have a mental health intervention, but also it'd be okay to be sad and go out. You don't have to be the life of the party to be able to be gay or queer and be part of a community. Um, so that's what we were doing before the pandemic, then we took some work online and we were holding healing peer-to-peer -peer group spaces, again, for queer people of colour, with lived experience of mental health, addiction, trauma, disability. Um, and now we're, yeah, doing, doing lots more um, and figuring out along the way, how do we resource the work? Um, initially it was, bits of our own funds, some of us were on benefits and we're using some government funding or government benefits to fund bits of our work. We recognized that events or nightlife for some of us were artists or worked within nightlife. That was kind of a way to generate some income, but came across a big barrier all of a sudden with the model was that most nightlife relies on alcohol sales to work and we were trying to be sober. And so actually, 
all of these venues or spaces that wanted to work with us they were like yeah but you can do it on a Tuesday night um and we were like no we want it on a Friday or a Saturday night where people are out um but no one wants to buy alcohol and then you're not going to hit your bar sales so initially it was through t- pay what you can ticketing um and it seemed to work out it was free open to anyone um and then we moved into the arts funding space because it seemed that arts funding in some ways you can do some more of this mental health work and it's a lot easier it can be called an art project um and just don't call it therapy or don't call it mental health work and just call it art and people are getting together and painting and that could be funded and then we held a crowd funder we had we had done a bunch of our events and then covid happened and we did a community crowd funder and that was really we weren't sure if we should or not and we didn't want to extract money from our community that was already suffering but having been able to build up a platform and build a community around us and had some sort of social media following had a successful crowd funder um and now and have now applied for a few mutual aid grants and trust funds um there was also some covid emergency relief funds that were quite easy to access um like I think the LGBT charity Metro um, alongside Comic Relief did some emergency like grassroots funds. So yeah, that's how we sort of resourcing it money-wise, still trying to figure that out. Um, and then other stuff is time and it's skills and it's been tapping into people that we know. So we made it work because we were paying people, but it was over 50 pound to like run a session, but we knew there were people, there were our friends, they were within the community and they were able to provide space for free, their time for free, their resources, their materials, their paint, their equipment. Yeah, that's, that's kind of a little bit of our journey. Thank you so much, X. It's really, really interesting, especially to hear about um, the ways that like trying to resource your work is meant trying to categorize it and how you've kind of um, had to work around like tailoring stuff to art spaces or mental health spaces and things like that and venue and event spaces as well. Uh, Emma, we'll go to you next. Thank you. And yes, it is it is really interesting about that point about how you categorise yourself because uh, I think certainly in terms of funding underground lights has been kind of working through some of those issues as well. So. Um, yes, I'm I'm Emma, and yeah, I run Underground Lights Community Theatre in Coventry, and uh, we set up as a charity back in 2018 um, for people with experience of homelessness and or mental health issues. Um, and I guess the idea uh, came from myself and my co-founder when we were having a lot of conversations um, about. I guess how theatre and how being involved in the arts had really benefited us and, you know, helped with our own journeys, our our own mental health. Um, But also thinking about assumptions, actually, and wanting to challenge some assumptions that happen. I think there's there's still in the arts industry a real sense of theatre as being something that you do if you have lots of money or that you see if you have lots of money. Um, and we're thinking we, we want to challenge that. We want to you know, allow people to explore uh, their own creative identities, to move beyond um, other labels or diagnoses, to kind of to, to be something else. And I think one of the things I've I've noticed on the journey is that often if we're doing a performance or a sharing, sometimes people will assume that we're going to be doing very direct awareness raising so people are expecting to see things about homelessness or things about mental health and often because we're we're a we're a member-led space and so we can kind of come in and say oh what what do we want to work on over the next few weeks um often those things will be uh full of joy or hope or positivity and so sometimes people are surprised when they come along and see a pantomime for example rather than you know kind of a very serious awareness raising piece so actually sometimes just challenging those assumptions that we can actually we can you know do all kinds of arts-based work um 
I guess in terms of our journey and, and resourcing so far, um, the first year of activity, so that was 2019, I was um, working on a, a voluntary basis and uh, trying to get things set up and also find core funding which is a, a huge challenge. Um, I think as, as many uh, user-led organizations and groups will know. Um, and it was, it, was, it was really tough, it was really challenging. Um, and at the end of that year, we did get some core cool funding from Tudor Trust uh, to pay me for three days a week, which was absolutely fantastic. And I think the importance of having flexible funders um, who uh, who you can talk to uh, about the challenges you're facing been I think really really important for us. Um, it meant that in 2020 we we went into into our second year of activity thinking great you know we can take a breath we can find some solid ground, but obviously COVID meant that that we were in a very a very different place and so we were having to change our models of working like like everyone else and and running online. Um, this year um, has been, again, very interesting because Coventry is currently City of Culture. So there have been an awful lot of um, opportunities in that, an awful lot of growth, um, but also rising, rising demand. So within our organisation, which is tiny and running on a shoestring most of the time, we're having uh, an awful lot of um, projects, events, activities, uh, inquiries about our work which is which is great which is fantastic and exciting but also kind of being able to manage that growth um, and at the same time recognizing that our capacity and our resources are very limited um, has has been has been difficult as well so it's all the time balancing balancing those things um, I guess one other point to make about about resourcing I think the the value, the value of other people who get it and who who really understand, um, and those can be you know, people in in the underground lights community within the team, um, but also other organisations who who understand, um, particularly larger organisations. So for us, the the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry, where we're based at the moment, have been have been fantastic project partners, and we we definitely wouldn't be where we are uh, if it wasn't for them. And that is largely because right at the start, um, before we became a charity, um, we essentially pitched the idea to, uh, to the general manager at the, at the Belgrade. Um, and it was just before she was coming into, into post. And she, and she understood, she understood the value of, of a lived experience led organization and group and, and, appreciated as well the importance of having that as an as an independent organization but something that could potentially be be hosted within the structures of the Belgrade and so because the theatre has a program called the Springboard Company Program we were advised to apply for that and we were successful so for the period of three years and we're just coming to the end of three years at the moment uh, we have mentoring and in-kind support from from the Belgrade, so that's been a really a really positive relationship, and it's you know it's helped us to kind of grow and build our capacity. So, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Yeah, it's really um, really interesting to hear about like that the value of of other people who get it and like the difference when that's the starting point and how that impacts kind of relationships going forwards. So, um, Leah, I'll, I'll hand to you. Okay, thank you very much, Ari. Hi, so my name is Leah. I'm the CEO for Angels of Hope for Women Charity. So we started in 2014, just as a... Leah, I think you've frozen. I don't know if you can hear us. Leah frozen for other folks as well. Yeah, she has. <laughs> All right. Give her another few seconds and then I'll try and, and reach her <laughs> outside of Thanks, this. Amy. <laughs> I 
Okay, well, while we're waiting for um, Liz just dropped out. Okay, uh, while we're waiting for uh, Liz to be able to, to make it back, um, this doesn't tend to happen in like face to face, does it? People don't just sort of disappear. Um, I guess we could start off with what seems to be a really nice link actually between um, underground lights and misery, which is that question of the overlap of arts funding and mental health funding. I wonder if either of you could speak more about that and, and how you've, um, maybe how the assumptions are different in arts funding and in mental health funding and how you found that. Yeah, I can I can say a little bit more about that. Um, I think certainly in terms of the uh, the larger funding bodies. So, for example, the the Arts Council um, and say the the National Lottery. Um, I know that in terms of conversations or in terms of bids, you really need to think quite carefully about how you position yourself as an organisation. Um, so we uh, we're currently putting in a bid to the Arts Council, and we have put in uh, a bid before to to the lottery. So we've had an awards for all grant from them. Uh, we reached the second stage of the Reaching Communities Fund, but but we weren't successful with with that funding bid. Um, but in terms of lottery funding, certainly we we needed to think about how to position ourselves. Almost uh, thinking about the mental health benefits of the arts. So so it's not an arts project. Otherwise, the the lottery will be thinking, well, you know, maybe that's something that the arts council should be should be funding. So really, really thinking about you know, the the beneficiary journey, all about the well being aspects. Um, I'm really kind of um, focusing on those things. Um, with the Arts Council bid that we're currently preparing, thinking um, a lot more about things like um, public engagement, the audience, you know, what's, what's, what are, what's the work that we want to do? What are, what are the creative pieces that we want to perform in order to engage with our, with our audiences and with those, with those communities? So although the, the well-being or the, the mental health aspects are, are within that, there's, there's more of a focus around what's, what's, the, what's the creative work going to look like and how, we, how we're going to engage with communities around that. So I think tailoring your organisation or your project to the, to the needs of funders, which I think happens anyway, um, is yeah, very, very present. But I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Completely agree. And I could talk about this for hours. I don't want to get all philosophical and theorise, but um, I mean, it's the biggest problem with funding is that projects are then tailoring themselves to a funder and just not being able to just be and then funders recognising their value. But that aside, um, a bigger thing that we're trying to unpack and challenge with misery is, I don't know if it's a colonial thing or not, but in in, in different parts of the world or in different traditions like arts isn't the separate thing that you go out and consume and neither is healing maybe there's not a, there's not a nation state there that you can go to a therapist and there's and that's maybe not great either however people getting together and creating and making and ritual and dance and ceremony is part of well-being and is part of systems of community care um, whether that be getting together and cooking or feeding or body work and massages all of these traditions and practices that we've used over time and people of color have used all around the world to sustain ourselves to sustain our lives um, and so at the arts council that's maybe dance or theater right and then but for maybe it's not it's not theater to go to the west end to put on a show but it's about like practicing and telling your story and self-expression which is about your journey of identity and figuring yourself out and that's how you've overcome a moment of depression in your life and so trying to articulate that to a funder well it's either like mental health and you need to go under diagnosis like under this western medical model of like health and talk about it like that or you need to go under like arts and talk about how you're making great art and how this is a great artistic experience. And so I think all of that is messed up in general that you have, you're forced to do this and we're trying to figure out how, and you don't want to lie. You want to like be, but you are telling a story. And actually like when I'm working, like my funding hat on as a fund, like as a person that gives that funding, it's all about a story, right? 
as a teacher, when you're marking like an exam, you have 60 exams, you have two minutes, they're paying you like two pounds an exam. You're skim reading that shit, right? It's not, you, you don't have time. You're telling a story and you want to encapsulate people. Something sets off a spark, then somebody might spend more time like figuring you out. Um, in your tight word count or boxes, um, or depending on what the, that funder is looking for, you're, they're only going to ever li literally get a glimpse of what you are unless they're coming with you along that journey. And so tell them what they want to hear, but also obviously be true to yourselves. And so my advice would always be to like, look at your funder. Often they have a strategy, the Arts Council just put out there, let's create a strategy, but the Tudor Trust or whichever like different um, health commissioning bodies, they'll have their different strategies, their priorities. So you look at, okay, these are these guys' priorities. How do, what, how and what am I doing fit into that? And I think that's really annoying as a person in the world, because I'm like, why am I having to figure out how I'm helping you in your strategy? And like, I'm not a strategist, I'm not a policymaker. Like I'm just being, or do, I'm an artist or I'm a community leader. That's like extra labor that you should be doing. Um, so that's a shift I would like to see, but um, that's kind of what you have to do. It's kind of the system. Some funders are better and more flexible, um, but for the bigger institutions, like awards for all, okay, what is the National Lottery's priorities for this year? What's Comic Relief's priorities for this year? How am I, how can I tell my story in a way that meets that answer? Thank yeah. you. I think that really resonates also with um, Ray's keynote about kind of narratives and the pressure that's put on people with lived experience of, of mental ill health, but also who experience other kinds of oppression to, to constantly be um, narrativizing and presenting like a, not necessarily a positive narrative, but certainly a neat narrative. Uh, we have Leah back. So uh, Leah, do you want to pick up where you, uh, where you were interrupted and explain the work that you do with Angels of Hope for Women? Yes, sorry about that, internet issues. <laughs> yeah, so um, as I was saying before, it's a, an organization that supports women from the BEM community. Um, and some of those also experience some mental health issues as well. But because of the stigma that's behind mental health, this is something that they normally wouldn't talk about. So in terms of uh, resourcing, we create that space for these women to come together and talk about issues that affect them, uh, cultural issues. That means, you know, they are not able to go out there and get any support regards their um, uh, mental health and well-being. Uh, we do have quite a lot of volunteers who help us quite a lot. They do some peer-to-peer -peer support, one-on-one -on -one support. We also have trustees. Obviously, they all give up their time to uh, support and run some of these sessions for us. And yes, we've got some, um, in the past, we have got some funding from uh, different organizations. Recently, we got one from Ensan, which helped us to pay six months for a venue where these women will be meeting every month for the next six months. We don't have to think about the funding. And that's creating that space, safe space for these women to come together, talk about issues that concern them and how they can then support each other. Amazing. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, you mentioned volunteering, and um, I think uh, it, it might be interesting for, for everyone to sort of think about how does how does volunteering work in your organisations? And also, is it related to what you were talking about, X, about that fear of not wanting to, say, exploit the community that you're working with in that, that you know, um, not, not wanting to either... <laughs> super monetize everything and also not wanting to let people do um stuff that is uh to rely too heavily on, on unpaid labor um yeah I, yeah i'd love to hear more about that. yeah so with with our volunteers obviously uh, most of them are women who we've supported as organize an organization and they've seen how we've supported them They've been very happy with the uh, help we've given them. They've been empowered. They then want to give back to the community. And one of the ways they want to give back is by coming to talk to other women, running those peer-to-peer -peer support groups, attending our monthly events, and being um, like an example of what they went through and where they are now. So they can talk to other women to support and empower those women to think 
right? If this person was what, where they said they were, and now look what they are doing and where they are now, they, that really motivates other people to also want to attend some of these sessions, get empowered, get the support that's needed within the community for them also to be on a level where they are actually now able to be a support within the community because most of these women do want to support so many people however they don't have that opportunity uh, one because english is their second language they don't know how to go about you know going to any organization to ask for how they can volunteer so when they come to small organizations like ourselves it's a very big opportunity for them to showcase you know their talents and what they can do and it's really really helpful to other women who see what's happening and then they're able to give back to the community as well Can I come in on that a little bit? And so for us, it's, it's definitely that just wanting that relationship not to be extractive or exploitative and like taking the piss out of someone and just like getting them to do the sort of the chores that you don't want to do. Um, and also valuing that emotional work, that peer to peer to work is labor and it should be being paid for because there's other stuff that's being paid for that isn't, isn't maybe as like generative or life changing. Um, but also recognizing when we were doing this work. So part of our um, part of our intervention is hosting a sober rave, and it's not preaching sobriety. Um, we could be mental health in another way, but it's about creating a space that's possible. And for many people in recovery or struggling with addiction, coming out to a sober space to just be a participant would still be too overwhelming. But being able to volunteer or give their time or be involved or contribute or work in the space as part of their journey of getting better or part of their recovery or part of their well-being and wanting to just contribute wanting to give is their way of engaging in the work and so recognizing that also and then, then at the same time there's that skills development that can happen alongside this people wanting to be able to try something new and actually this is a safe space because this is me and my peers and i'm going to be supported here and i can actually be my mad self or i can cry or i can come and show up all myself and I know that I'm going to be held um, so I can try out something new and I can take a risk or to be able to sit in the space um, in it, all my feelings I need something to do because my brains I overthink or I can get really fast pacing thoughts and actually pouring people cups of water or having cups being responsible for the tea is actually going to help me be focused so recognizing that as a sort of an exchange um, but yeah, especially when you're first starting up, you do need, you don't have all the money, you can't pay everyone for their time. And it's just who you work with, recognizing, I would say just communicate clearly where you're at. There's transparency on like, hey, actually I'm not making any money out of this either. So the other person knows, or I am, right? Actually, this is a paid full-time job. And if you're coming, like you need to know that this is what the situation is. Um, and checking in on that person, like, are they losing out? Are they are they get, like they're losing out because of there? Do they need to pay for childcare to be there? Is there a way that you could then find some childcare costs to cover that? Um, could you pay for their travel back and you know figuring those things out? Yeah, I I totally agree, Akas, and that's what we do because for some funding that we get over, so we just get funding for um, different projects. As Emma said, it's quite difficult to get the uh, that core funding, so. When we do some, we do get some of that and we, we do get for volunteer expenses. So we'd pay for some of the expenses, whether it's getting a taxi or going on the bus and things like that. But obviously it's not as much as someone who's, who's actually got a full-time job. And as Emma said earlier as well, it's quite good to have different organizations within the community who understand what we do and who are very helpful. So we have different women's organizations uh, within Manchester that work with us so they know just like them that it's not all the time that you get the funding to give to the speakers so when we get it would they pay them something to come and speak but at times when we don't have they just come there so do you want me to come and talk to the women we've got mental health nurses who just put in their time we've got doctors psychologists who we know if we had it would give something to them but yes we do support with a little bit of voluntary expense depending on the funding that you get obviously because that, that that's what it depends on I think for us, there's, um, I think the point about the emotional labour, emotional support is, is really key. So we have the core funding for a staff team, uh, but the staff team is 
is very small. So there's um, there's me on three days a week. We have a drama facilitator, which is sort of 12 week blocks. So kind of turn time only on uh, 10 hours a week and an assistant on six hours a week, turn time only. So when our posts are added up together, we're, we're essentially one, one full time staff member. And and I think when we're working with larger organisations that can sometimes be overlooked or, or forgotten sometimes. Um, it's we find that we can get the money for, uh, say, funding to run a drama group, for example. But given the society that we're in at the moment, we find that the statutory services around mental health support are are very poor, as as we know. And so quite a lot of our labour and our emotional labour is in supporting our members and sometimes making making links with community mental health teams, for example, or social workers or going out and saying, maybe maybe you'd like to do your job. But now maybe, maybe this is for you because, you know, we're a tiny organisation. We do drama. Um, we want to support people. We're supporting each other. But actually, there are there are huge gaps and we can't, you know, we can't cover everything. And I think throughout this year it's been a huge learning curve for us as we've kind of um tried to to support people and then felt very uh burnt out afterwards because we because we can't do we can't do everything and kind of knowing where our boundaries are and our limits are um while still being a, a compassionate and a really caring organization which I think we are is is I think really really hard and I think that emotional labor is yeah is really tough and I can see other organizations that I connect with small organizations across the country doing doing similar kinds of work um and and paying for things out of their own pocket as as well and self-funding so yeah so uh, I wondered if anyone else wanted to come in on that question of like the current context I guess of austerity and of, of stretch services and how that impacts your work um the, the thing like we're doing this work out of survival and need but just like piecing all of this together reminded me my friend once told me you're not the head of the nhs and i, and I feel like it just it gave me that little took a bit of weight off my shoulder like i'm doing this because i need to survive and also my friends are out here dying and don't want to be dramatic but it's also true and so we're doing this because it's not out there, but that, that piece around like doing that work with community mental health teams or getting people like helping them get benefits or signposting them to other free therapy provider, providers. And we will recognize that we're not a crisis mental health service. We can't offer that. We don't have the skills to be able to offer that, but we're people with lived experience and we have certain skills and talents, but we can't like save your life. But it's also not our job to save your life and recognizing that. But then also who like, whose job is it? And then thinking about like solidarity politics and no one else is gonna save you. It's all a lot. The like specific challenge that we found is with those referral pathways. So I would suggest to all of you as a user-led group, like find those organizations, charities, systems, like Ensign, like a local community trust, like a local arts organization, like the theater down the road that does have a project for people that are like suffering with loneliness, whatever it is. Um, because our community is queer and trans people, there's not many services really tailored for queer and trans people, but then particularly people of color. So there is some LGBT organizations, but they're not culturally sensitive. And there are some BAME led organizations, but they don't necessarily have the queer and trans specific um, context in their practice. And so it's been really difficult to find those. That's why we set up as a group because they, it didn't exist. And that's, I imagine as many user led groups, that's also why they set up because as the services aren't there in their local context meeting that need. Um, but there are bigger organizations that, and there are some good people or some people like you in these organizations that care and want to do the work and there's that networking. And that's also a full-time job going out and meeting these people, especially if you want to stay in bed all day or you're struggling with paying the bills. Um, but yeah, networking, meeting people and asking for help um, and asking to be made introductions to people. And then, yeah, that final thing about the austerity, like we're just seeing it more and more that the stories that we hear through our friends or people that are coming and they're just like, this is terrible. Like the, 
the local authority should be responsible for this or somebody should be doing something or and it's not like the doctors don't care they, they, they really do care and it's not like the nurses don't care it's just that it's completely overstretched and the wait times are ridiculous for help um, and people even showing up in emergency settings like asking for help and then just yeah, being taken and then not being taken into the inward and just sent home and like go to your local talking heads thing as a 12 month waiting list and then maybe you'll get that you know and that's the sort of current yeah situation out there yeah so uh, uh, just to add on uh, what uh, like as i said for us what we find challenging is these women have got multiple disadvantages so some of them they don't have any education they might have gone through um abusive relationships and they've run away from those relationships some of them might still be in those relationships so for such a person they haven't they, they haven't got the, the 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 courage they've not been empowered to go to a mental health service they, they, they just can't can't do it so they need that support of someone doing it with them so what we for us i think how, what we feel is having these mental health um, organizations come to our events to talk to these women so that the women are able to understand what goes on when you're referred. As I said, because of the stigma in the community, they wouldn't want to be seen to go and access a mental health service, so to say, but coming to small events like ourselves, we invite these big organizations to come and talk to, to, to these women about mental health and what it entails. And I think for us, what works more is getting someone either a psychologist who's from the same cultural background who understands what they are going through and then explaining to them what they you know what they can get when they go for support and for some of them actually what they need is just to come out of the house and talk to each other about issues and then they can look at coping mechanisms and from that we personally feel that it, it stops most of them uh, ex escalating and going any further because they've spoken about things, they've got some uh, peer support if they feel in a certain way, they know they can phone someone and talk to. But yes, obviously for those people who really need to be referred, I think it's about these mental health services, or the NHS coming in to talk to these women where they are and not expecting everyone to go to them because for some people it's very difficult to take that step and go to them. Thank you so much. Really, um, I think pretty damning reflections on on um, how difficult people find it to to access support right now. And I think really important to highlight when we're talking about resourcing user led groups that we're not saying, oh well, user led groups should be able to like fix everything, and uh, you should be able to like I don't know save the world in the next twenty minutes. Um, I think in just to sort of like finish up before we open up for some questions, what do you think is the the number one change you'd like to see in how funders can more proactively fund user-led work that puts kind of the people affected by uh, mental Ill health and by other forms of, of societal oppression and marginalization right at the heart of, of kind of decision making and support and and the the stuff that's being done on the grassroots. Um, just a just a small question to finish off with. <laughs> What's like the number one big question? Do you want to go first, Emma? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, gosh, yeah, it's that's a huge question, isn't it? Really, I think I am. I'm very aware of the privilege, I guess, that that I can carry with me uh, for underground nights so um years ago when I was working as a service user researcher I was told by uh, an institution that they liked working with me because I was quote non-threatening um which I think may amount to um uh, saying because you're a white middle class woman and I think that the the privileges that I have in terms of being able to negotiate my way through funding bids uh, to write in the, the language that funders want to want to hear, um, to have the, the platforms and the, the access to meetings. Uh, because of that, I'm, I'm really aware of. And I think that when we're thinking about fundraising and systems I think that a lot needs to change in terms of the accessibility 
of, of forms, um, understanding the requirements of funders. I think I just something as straightforward as fund, funding databases, actually, because obviously many larger organisations can pay uh, to access fundraising databases. And if you're a small grassroots organisation, you, you can't afford to pay for the database to do your fundraising research. Um, so I think there's there's a lot there around that. I think in terms of decision makers on panels, uh, we need to have more people with lived experience making those decisions. And it would be nice to know who's making those decisions, often with very small uh, funding bodies. You send off your form or your letter and you think, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the quirks of this funder or who's, who's assessing this. So maybe more transparency. I mean, that's not one thing, really. that's like six things there. So, but I, I'll, I'll pause, otherwise I'll just, I could go on for a long time on this. Yeah, so uh, to add on what Emma has said, uh, I also personally feel that there's too much of being put in a box, um, tick box, everything has to be, is, is what they want. I feel like for small organizations, if the funders could give us opportunities to do case studies, either talk to someone who's, who's gone through our services or just write a normal case study and send it to them, you know, for them to actually understand what kind of work you do and not just ticking the box because it's, it's, it's a BEM organization and this, 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 is understanding what you do. And also, as Emma said, I think having on these panels, people with, not just people with lived experiences, but say, for example, people from the BEM community as well, because they will, they will be in a better position to understand the issues that you go through. Because as Emma said, if you are not very uh, articulate, you're not able to write what the words that they want to hear, you're not able to do that, you will never, you will never be able to get that funding. So at the points like that, it's case studies through videos, you know, people who've Who've, who've gone through these services and they've been empowered. It's think people like that, I think for me, that the funders need to listen to as well. An example for us is our current chair of trustees went through DV. Uh, we supported her throughout and now with her uh, uh, kids, she's got a, a house on her own. She's now working on her own. And uh, she, she also became our chair of trustees. So you can see how empowered she is. And she's now wanting to do the same to other women. And as a chair of trustees, she's there at the forefront, talking to the women, what she's gone through, where she's at now. She's now got a very good job um, that, you know, that she didn't uh, know she would get as soon as, because this all happened just within the last, uh, during the, COVID, the pandemic, during the last year. So having someone like that talking to funders, Honestly, it makes a very, very big difference. Um, yeah. So much to say. Um, that case studies thing is making me think about this idea of like impact measurement and in your funding application, you need to show the impact that you're doing. But people get PhDs in like methodology on how to <laughs> write about impact measurement in terms of social impact or in health and well-being. And so you're expecting somebody with lived experience that's just that intuitively knowing what they're doing to also be able to write about themselves in this way. And the people that are giving the money might have a PhD in this stuff, right? And if you pay a full-time fundraiser 40K a year, they can also write in that way. But people that are out here doing the work don't know how to do that. So yeah, do a case study, make a video, or just come down to the project and meet the pe people that are going on and just see the work for yourself. And I think operationally, obviously, I work for a funder, so I know there's this time of staff is not there and the need is like so great, but I think systems can be changed that you don't have to write strategy and policy to be able to just show like the importance of your work. And if funders do really, they've made all these big commitments to being more inclusive and accessible, then like actually just go out and do it. Like it's not that difficult. Um, I think there is this thing around diversifying panels, um, but I think wider than that, and this is like a, big ask of the world I do believe like oppression lives in our nervous systems and it's about risk so it's this thing that we whether they're consciously like I'm not a racist person but still you're seeing something and it's somewhat different to you so you see it as more risky right and so these mad queer brown people well that's a bit risky but this institution that is going to do an exhibition on LGBT POC history maybe we'll fund that because it's the Tate and we know the Tate you know, or we know that like this, and they can then go and talk about that organization, but we won't actually just go to the people that are like doing the work. And actually you give the people a hundred pounds and they're going to take over the world and you, the Tate won't do anything for a hundred pounds. They need a million to do that same thing. 
and actually for the value for money that you could actually you could happen i'm sure like with both of your groups 50 pounds is going to stretch so far and you need to give it to one of these bigger institutions it's nothing's going to happen you know that's one hour of your office time really for that for that sort of money um so yeah funders and people really unpacking risk and like where does that sit and it's like this fear that of like of the other um and let's start doing some embodied work and un unpacking where that comes from and then like take those risks because it's not actually a risk it's like innovation in other sectors would be seen as exciting but over here we're seen as like risky or the other um and then yeah the way that yeah, we can make forms more accessible, la 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 la. But it's why are we having to write about ourselves and prove impact in this way when that's actually not our job? Like we're doing your job for you. This was your job was to give out these funds to achieve this. Well, we're achieving it. So just actually we're doing your job for you, but now you're making us work twice as hard um, to even be on the table. Yeah. So much, so much there. Um, I'd like to open things up to questions from the from the chat, or if you want to um, just raise your hand on Zoom and ask your question in person. Um, got a question for the panel. Um, what advice do you have for evidencing your work or impact of your work whilst actually doing the work? And how can we make that easier with limited resources? Does anyone want to speak to that? simply for us like our events made a little guest book like a little <laughs> a little book that people could like leave their messages on and so from the jump it was like let's try and capture this stuff and then because our users use social media and it might not be your might not be your audiences we were able to like capture a little quotes and bits and it's not the neatest or the cutest that a funder might expect but we were just and sometimes it looks a bit messy, but we were just taking these quotes and people were like this event saved my life and I just put that quote and then stuck it in there and it is a bit Fetish, like, fetishization or dramatic but I was like this is what people have said um so capturing from the start and then the other depending on what your project is sometimes you might not want to ticket your event but often the free ticketing platforms if you do ticket them capture data for you um and then you can just pull it it pulls it all into a spreadsheet so if you are ticketing your stuff um that can give you sort of like audience analytics they can tell you how many people came where they were where they were from and then even more demographic data if you knew that so that was one way that we were able to evidence the impact like hey this these people are coming and this is what they've said yeah for us we did oh sorry me if i cut in <laughs> done it again you go first this time you go first. okay no problem so for us mainly we do a uh, case studies so people will come to us and especially for uh, the people who can't write themselves so they'll talk to us and then we'll write down the case studies those who can do videos we do uh, videos as well which is right there and then maybe after an event or after after a session we write it down uh, we do some um, feedback forms as well uh, at the end of the project so it's just where they were at where they are now uh, we know what difference is made to them so it's just having those uh, um, it's many uh, three questions where they were what they've accessed and where they are now as a result of accessing our service and we just do it that way. And we uh, we evidence through, um, I suppose, member journals. So at the end of at the end of each session, um, people just write down how how they found it, what they what they got out of the session. We do video journals as well. Uh, if people don't want to write things down or um, as Nia says, we can write things down as well. And then at the end of each block of activity, um, so we would usually kind of do some do some creative work, have some kind of sharing or performance. And then afterwards, we, we always have a, a celebration evaluation session and that can really be helpful in terms of getting case studies or kind of focus group work. Sometimes we'll, we'll audio record those uh, those sessions as well uh, so we can so we can kind of draw out what people are saying and I think for us as well we find that there's there's a lot of love for for the organization and for each other so so it feels quite quite easy to do and that people are always I know saying yeah I really enjoyed it this is what was good yes you can you know you can you can share that further so uh, yeah so that helps us to kind of bring case studies together. 
it sounds like a really clear link between those experiences is the importance of making that like impact measurement something that people actually want to do and making it useful for the organization but maybe more importantly the people who are like uh, you know maybe there's not that much of a difference between the people who come to groups and, and events and the organization but making it something that basically members are really actively engaged in rather than that sort of um uh thing where people feel like they have to fill out a form to kind of continue accessing services and things like that um we had one more question which was about even when people access mental health services they often receive top-down pathologizing models so uh address the power dynamics of medicine and healthcare um how do you get health services to address the reductive perspective of seeing normal responses to oppression discrimination violence neglect and trauma as illnesses so i guess that's about how user-led groups can um, be part of uh, depathologizing experiences of, of mental distress and ill health. It's such a big question. Um, I guess like the, the dream solution is change who's at the top. You said like user-led groups can't change the world in 20 minutes, but actually I do believe we can if you gave believe in people power and if we gave people the power then these things would change there's been models like models of where there's not been this sort of doctor client relationship that have worked around the world in different in different communities and and even in the west um yeah would well, change is at the top yeah i think you're so right i think like user led groups can offer that model of peer-to-peer -peer support and breaking down that um, binary of, you know, supporter and supported. Um, we are coming up to the end of our time. I'll just open it out to our panellists. Is there anything else you'd like to say or kind of gather from what we've spoken about? I guess just picking up on that. That last question as well. The um, going back to the challenging, challenging assumptions, and sometimes just by just by being here and doing doing what we do, um, people people see that and and see that we're that we're doing things differently. We are we are challenging things and we are challenging those labels. And I think when we then work with uh, larger organisations, I was saying earlier about you know others others who get it. Um, so for us, uh, an organisation like uh, Arts and Homelessness International, um, which are very, very committed to uh, thinking about you know, people lived experience, what does that look like, uh, the importance of recognising people as artists and paying people for their work and, and those principles and those values kind of underpinning that. I think that when we work with, with those large organisations, then we, then we start to see things, things shift a bit more uh, but I think it's yeah it's there's a lot of work still to be done in terms of different sectors and I see something shifting slowly and I'm, I'm moving a bit and I see other things that are still quite quite entrenched so yeah still still a way to go yes uh, I agree with Emma there's still a long way to go but I think for 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 me it would be good to have opportunities like this what Ensign has done you know or smaller organization, bringing people together in a forum like this, where they talk about their, their issues uh, and the funders can have a better understanding of what these people actually go through. Because apart from that, I don't think uh, most of the things will change that much. It's all tick box, tick box, because some of them don't even have a better understanding of you know, where you started from, the whole reason you started the organization, you know, why you are doing what you're doing. So I think having platforms like this for small organizations would be very, very helpful. And I'm very grateful to Ensign because we've been having these uh, peer support groups for the people who got the side-by-side uh, -side fund, and it has helped us a lot. Uh, all of us who go on, on that forum is, is helped us. We've even made connections outside of this where we've gone at the back and started to support each other, depending on what, what, what we are good and what we're not good at. So I think it's, it's it, that, that's what funders need to be doing is things like this. 
So I have three thoughts that leave you if you're trying to figure out how to resource your group. Um, first one would be to ask for help. There's somebody out there that is paid in a full-time job to probably deliver the service that you're already delivering. And finding that person might take you three years. Um, finding that organization out there might take you a long time, but ask for help. Um, and there'll be people really willing um, to offer their knowledge, their time, their resources, that free space. And it's difficult and it's a competitive environment and the need is so great, um, but ask. Um, and then part two is be annoying. Um, if you're wanting to get funding from the Arts Council, you could probably find my email online and I work there and I can, might be able to help you somewhat. Or you could even find a Kiko and Rory's email online somewhere and say, hey, Rory, help me. I need your help. Be annoying. Now, as a funder, we say, no, email our customer services email address. However, you get your face in there, you turn up to the events while well, Kiko's just put the email right there, right? Those people will see your email and you email them 10 times and they might end up coming to your event and seeing your work because you've emailed them 10 times. You see that the Royal Opera House, they, they have the number to the Arts Council CEOs on speed dial. They can call them and say, hey, come and see our work. That happens. And then the Royal Opera House continues to get funding. Right. So it's be annoying. And people might find you a little bit annoying at first. But if you know what you're doing is great and they really need to come and see the work or they really need to get to know you. Those 10 emails will mean that they'll respond, someone will respond, be annoying. Um, and then the last one is slow down. Um, and it's something that I still need to learn, but me asking for help and being annoying, the advice I've been given from people that have been doing this sort of work for 20, 25 years and kept their organizations going and sustainable was you're gonna have all of these opportunities suddenly coming to you or when you start making these connections and you wanna to wanna to do all of the things um, and resourcing that, um, and paying for stuff out of your own pocket might work for a little while, but you'll end up presenting the work or you'll end up burning out or your mental health will take a toll and actually just slow down. We've This last year, we've only done one thing and it was like a, one simple thing that was fully funded that we were able to do. And besides that, we haven't done anything for the whole year. We've just taken time to look inwards and figure out how do we re literally figure out this question? How do we resource our group and keep it going and keep it safe? Um, and it was a difficult decision to make because it was last year it was like pandemic and it was like, go, 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 go. We need to like save ourselves and save our people. Um, and this year it's been like, actually just stop. If we want to keep doing this for the next 20 years, then let's figure that out. So ask for help, be annoying and slow down. Completely agree with those three points. They're great. That's a really good summary. It's amazing. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you to the panelists, the interpreters, and everyone who's asked questions and been listening. Um, yeah, looking forward to seeing you at some of the other uh, AGM events. Take care, everyone.